Hi, Room 15. This is Chapter 19, Secret of Nim, The Boniface Estate. Mrs. Frisbee said, Jonathan and Mr. Ages got the screen open. Yes, Nicodemus said, and without them I doubt we could have done it. The steel frame is strong, the bolt was secure, and the wire so stiff we could not have bent it, enough, bent it enough for one of us to go through. So we were glad they were with us and asked them if they would, after all, like to stay with us. Since there were only two of them, they said they would, for the time being at least. And now began a journey that was to last, with some interruptions, for almost two years. Parts of it were pleasant. It was a joyful feeling at first, just to be free again, and to get those laboratory collars off. But parts of it were terrible. I have made notes about all of it, and if the time ever comes when rats publish books of their own, I intend to write a book about it. It would be a long book, full of trouble and danger. Too much to tell now. It was in one of the dangerous times that I lost my eye and got the scar that you see on my face. But we did have some happy times, and some pieces of great good luck, two in particular, that helped to explain how we got here and what our plans are now. It was early summer when we got out. We had known that beforehand we could tell by the lateness of the light through the woods, though it was dark when we finally stood on the roof. We had no trouble getting down the side of the building, however. There were down spurts, down spouts in the corners with plenty of toeholds. We dropped the screwdriver and the spool of thread into one of these. A little lower there, were, there was ivy. We were all good climbers, and there was moonlight to see by. In less than 15 minutes, we were on the ground. Staying in the darkest shadows, under the bushes where we could, we sped away from Nim, not knowing or caring at first what direction we were going, and nobody saw us. During the first few weeks, we lived as we could. We had, in a way, to learn all over again how to get along. For although the world outside the laboratory was the same, we ourselves were different. We were a couple of times reduced to eating from dumps and garbage cans, but knowing how to read, we quickly learned how to recognize signs on buildings, groceries, supermarkets, meat, meats and vegetables, for instance, let us know that there were food inside for the taking. And once inside a supermarket at night, they always leave a few lights on. We could even read the signs of the wall directing us to section eight for dairy products, cheese, section three for baked goods, and so on. In the country, there were barns and silos stocked with grain and corn and chickens full of chicken houses full of eggs. Occasionally, we came upon other rats, and a few times we talked to them, but not for long, because just after a few words, they would begin to look at us strangely and edge away. Somehow, they could tell that we were different. I think we even looked different. Either the diet or the injections at Nim had made us bigger and stronger than other rats, and all the strange rats we saw looked to us surprisingly weak and puny. So we were set apart from even our own kind. It was while we were in the country that we had, that we had our first important struck, stroke of luck. We had just about decided for nearly four months of freedom and constant roving to find a place to settle down, if not permanently, at least for the winter. We thought that it should be in the country, but not too far away from a town, so that we could have access to grocery stores as well as barns and gardens. It was about this time, too, that I began to wonder and worry somewhat about the fact that whatever we ate, whatever we needed, must always be stolen. Rats had, lived this, had always lived this way, and yet Why? I talked to some of the others about this. It was the beginning of discontent, an idea that kept growing, although slowly. The season was autumn. We were walking one evening down a winding country road. We never really, we never, we never walked on the road, but along the edge so that we can vanish in the bushes or the ditch if anyone came along. You can imagine that 20 rats and two mice traveling in procession would cause some comment, and we did not want that. As we walked, we reached a very high fence of wrought iron. The kind that looks like a row of black iron spears fastened together with pointed tops. An expensive fence, surrounding a large estate with a big, expensive-looking house in the middle, and well-kept grounds and gardens. We walked along past this fence until we reached a gate. There's nobody living in there, said Justin. How do you know? The gate's padlocked, and look, dead weeds standing outside of it, not even bent. Nobody's driven in here for a while. The house had a quiet, deserted look. There was a mailbox in front, hanging open, empty. I wonder if we could get in, Jenner said. Why should we? It's a big place. It would have a big pantry, big cupboard, big freezer. If it's empty as it looks, we turned into the grounds, moving cautiously, and from beneath some bushes, we watched the windows. As dusk fell, lights came on in several of them, both upstairs and down. Jenner said, that's supposed to make us think that there's somebody in there. Yes, said Justin, but there isn't. I could see one of the lamps when it came on. There was nobody near it. And they all came on at the same time. Automatic switches to keep burglars away. Well, they're not keeping me away, said Justin. 
He ran to the house, climbed into one of the windowsills, and looked. He tried another. Then he came back. Nobody, he said. So we went in. We found a small window in the back with a cracked pane, knocked out one corner of the glass, and climbed through. At first, we planned just to look for food. We found it, too, enough to last us for a year or more. As Jenner had predicted, there was a big freezer, well-stocked, bread, meat, vegetables, everything, and a whole room full of shelves covered with canned food. The cans baffled us at first, and as they had as they had in the grocery stores. We could read what was in them, but we couldn't get it out. Then Arthur found a machine on the kitchen counter. He read the instructions on the side of it. Slide can under cutter and press switch. So we tried it. The can turned slowly around in the machine, and when we pulled it out, the top had been cut free. I'll always remember that this was the first can, clam, ch clam chowder, and it was delicious. After we had eaten, we wandered around the house. It was a rich man's mansion with beautiful furniture and fine rugs and carpeting on the floor. There was a crystal chandelier in the living room and a big stone fireplace in the living room, in the dining room, excuse me. But the greatest treasure of all for us was the study. This was a large rectangular room with walnut paneling, a walnut desk, leather chairs, and walls lined to the ceiling with books. Thousands of books on about every subject you could possibly think of. There were shelves of paperbacks. There were also encyclopedias, histories, novels, philosophies, and textbooks of physics, chemistry, electrical engineering, and others. More than I can even name. Luckily, there were even some of these small ladders on wheels that they use in some libraries to get off the top shelves. Well, we fell onto these books with even more appetite than on the food, and in the end, we moved into the house and stayed all winter. We could do that, it turned out, without much fear of discovery. We learned that from the newspaper cuttings I found on the desk in the study. There was, they were about a wedding, and most of them showed pictures of newly married couple leaving a house to begin their honeymoon. The groom was a Mr. Gordon Boniface, heir to the gold Stetson fortune, and the house they were leaving, leaving was the house we were in. According to the clippings, they were going on a trip all the way around the world. They were coming back to the Boniface estate in May. Until then, it was our estate. Oh, there was a t caretaker garden who came three times a week, and once in a while he would check the house in a cursory sort of way. That is, he would unlock the front door, glance around to see that everything looked all right, and then lock it and leave. But he didn't live there. He lived in a small house down the road, and we were expecting him when, we, when he came. We had figured out from the way the place was kept up, the lawns mowed, leaves raked, gardens weeded and watered, that there had been somebody working on it. So we posted a watch, saw him coming, and kept watching him all the time he was there. And we made sure when he looked in the house that everything did look all right. This involved a certain amount of work. We had to haul our empty tin cans and other trash at night out into a hidden place in the woods quite far from the house. We cleaned up after ourselves carefully. We learned to use the water taps and the dusting cloths we found in the kitchen closet. If the caretaker had looked more closely, in fact, he would have seen that the kitchen counters were somewhat shinier than they would have been in an empty house. But he didn't. He never even noticed as a small corner of glass missing from the back window. And all winter, far into the night, we read books and we practiced our reading.